the Everything But Politics podcast. What's up, everyone? Welcome back to episode 42 of the Everything But Politics podcast. Today, we welcome Robert Finero, American actor best known for his role as Eugene Pointe Cervo in The Sopranos. And we're very excited to welcome him here as a guest. And uh, hear a little bit more of your story, Robert. Thanks for coming on the podcast. Merrick, thank you very much. Uh, and hello to Evan also. It's it's uh, it's great to be here. No, and it's, like I said before we uh, started this off, it's it's really exciting for us having obviously watched the show and and yeah. been influenced by, by it uh, a large amount. So, Robert, why don't you give us a little more context on yourself? And I may, I guess, maybe go back to when you were a kid. Were you always interested in becoming an actor? Was it something that just happened? How did your career kind of kick off? Well, they say, um, let me take them, put them, uh, can I call you later on that one? <laughs> and shut my phone. Um, I, uh, they they call it the bug. <laughs> I suppose I, I um I caught the bug um, from my uncle. He's a Monsignor, a priest in Brooklyn. And he started out as a young priest um, producing these small shows for this parish that he was in Howard Beach. And they called them the Gratian Players. And of course, my father was his brother. And we would go to his um, plays. And then it became bigger and bigger where he... Uh, expanded and he was raising money for Brooklyn charities in a pretty big way and doing musicals. Um, the, um, the Music Man, Hello Dolly, and using professional actors and some unprofessional actors, and they went on for, to professional careers. So he, it was, it, he grew up in, 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 into a, a very a professional level through the church and what they provided producing the shows. And we used to go to these and we would ham it up, me and my cousins. And that's really how I I uh, acquired the acting bug. I liked it. Um, I don't know, I, I guess I'm a little bit, I think all actors have a little bit of a solitary thing inside them. They just, I wasn't really a big sports guy. I did play sports, street corner sports, like the t uh, two hand touch. And, stuff like that. But anytime I was in an organized group of sporting people, I really never thrived, except for track and field. I liked that because it was a solitary experience that you could control. I ran high hurdles in high school and, and I ran some uh, short distance races, um, but I liked uh, running. So that's how I really acquired the acting bug. And then I went to college to Pace University where Bradley Cooper went to also I only did one year of of, of pace and, and then I lived my life and I was able to uh, get back I was blessed to get back into it once again in a different kind of way and and I studied and and uh, with a few great people and one thing led to another and it led to a play with Jane, James Gandolfini I, I owe him a lot uh, a street car named Desire we did three months in Europe. He played Mitch. I played Stanley. It was really my first professional job. We got paid in douche marks back then in the, um, um, it was the 80s, um, in the 80s, the late 80s. And the douche mark was really very strong. And it was, we're getting some good money there. And, and we felt really professional. It was a good production. We went and toured Scandinavia and Sweden and Norway, where I met my first wife, there in Norway, and uh, Jimmy said I was nuts, and I and I was in a way. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, and that's how I got my first big break into the business in theater. And then, of course, late later on, again, I really uh, started living my life again, and not really pursuing acting on a on a like a um, uh, walking the streets. They called it. Uh, we call it here in New York the beat. You know, like going to casting directors, trying to find work. I wasn't doing that. I worked at Caroline's. I worked at Madison Square Garden, left that job to work in Caroline. I was in entertainment. I was a, a supervisor um, at, 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 at MSG and then went to Caroline's where I was the skinniest bouncer on Broadway. <laughs> <laughs> Comedians used to uh, tease me. But when I left there, I was a manager 
And that's where Jimmy comes in. A friend of mine from the club, Gordon, uh, God bless him. He went up to Jimmy at a party, Gandolfini at a party, and said, if I was you, this is season after this, this beginning of season three, I would get Bobby. They call me Bob. Bobby for now. They called me at the club. Uh, job on your soprano. So what's Bobby doing? Jimmy said, oh, he's at Caroline's. He's a manager. Wouldn't you know, one one evening, I'm going to work to start the evening shifts and everybody, the waiters start the whole thing out and with the comedians and Jimmy's at the front bar having a drink. And I said, hello, what are you doing here? He said, I'm here for you. I'm here to offer you a role to audition for the Sopranos. And he said, have you been acting? And I lied and said, yeah, sure, I've been acting a lot. <laughs> what am I going to say no? He yeah. said he couldn't promise me anything and he couldn't guarantee me the role, but, you know, give me a shot. And I uh, I think two days later, I was in George Ann Walken's office and I was staying at Caroline studying my lines all night. And I was living in Staten Island and I landed a role in Soprano. So that's the trajectory of how I I got the bug and how one thing led to another. If I was to say anything to the young actors is to do everything and and and, and, and make contacts I had no agent. Jimmy was the finest agent I ever known. And God rest his soul. Yeah, no That's doubt. About amazing that. story. And so when you, like you said, like you never, you want to make all the contacts you possibly can. With you kind of being in Europe, and it sounds like you were always in New York. Did you ever make your way out west to Los Angeles and venture that lifestyle, or you never did that? Well, James did, and he did True Romance, and I believe he did Angie. He might have did Angie in New York. I was just watching some footage of Angie. You can see the uh, his early genius in that film. Is He was just so um, camera. Um, the camera loved James, I believe. It really did. I, when I saw him in Angie, I said, you know, something. And we kind of lose, lost contact. We were in contact with each other, but he was out in L.A., I never ventured out there. What I did was I had a a, a, a baby and then my I, I was living my life. So I never really tried LA. I did get out there eventually after The Sopranos and I did a short film called Cut Out with Al Martino who played um, Johnny Fontaine in The Godfather. God rest his soul too. He's a brilliant singer. And um, that was a great role for him. And, and uh, we did a short film. Mark Cantone directed that. And it was about a father and a son. And I was in Beverly Hills, but I never really ventured on Hollywood Boulevard, saw the Walk of Stars. And um, uh, people have told me to try it. I have some friends and said that, you know, you should go there for two, three years. But I, I'm i really New York based and I have my family, grandkids here. And I, I just, you know, I'm just going to ride it out here in New York City. You never know what can happen tomorrow. Like I can't say never, yeah. can't say never. Uh, but... Um, here I am. Well, Robert, you being from New York, how did that kind of influence your role as Eugene in The Sopranos? Did you feel more comfortable, you know, kind of being from New York and knowing a little bit about the mob scene? Did you feel more comfortable when you became Eugene? Well, you know, I'm from originally from Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. I've been around a lot of wise guys, their their attitude, how they behave and um. I got help from my cousin Chippy. He told me when I opened the bathroom scene, he said, you know, give me this, do this. That's what I did. What the hell are you looking at? So, you know, you grow up around this matrix of wise guys uh, in a pool center, um, you know, uh, so it kind of, you marinate in it. And then of course, good acting is always about some marination between the role itself and you and they kind of come together a lot of actors don't know what it is to be married in streetcar i really didn't know what it, that kind of love um that i had for stella that's that goes beyond the love of what's right and wrong and sometimes in marriages people do um things that the world or, or god would see as not right because of their love their bond between each other I mean, basically, Stella in that particular play lets her sister get taken away and lets Stanley um, kind of kick her out. Uh, at first, she wants to protect her, but then as Stanley kind of finds out her past, and which was um, Tennessee Williams, the writers, it was his past, his troubled past, the things that he did 
as being um, um, gay and, and living in America and, and his trouble. And he and so the act is what I'm trying to say, going back to the point of knowing what you're doing in, in terms of these wise guys you were saying, Evan, yeah. Have a good, a good, um, so to say, moxie yeah. <laughs> about about them, you know. Robert, yeah. in speaking of like just like the overall like good acting, making it seem so realistic, a scene that I came across when getting ready for this was the scene where Gene hangs himself, mm -hmm. and the, I mean, just the fact that it looks so real, like as a viewer, how do you, how is that? portrayed so accurately without like obviously you hurting yourself or is there something under you that's like edited well, how does that work well i'll tell you you know we at the at the um the the uh the bada bing um the wonderful uh stunt coordinator pete pagosi who did most of the stunts and he was the coordinator he's a wonderful man and, and, a, and a great stunt coordinator he's working all the time and he uh we rehearsed that uh, in the parking lot of the Bada Bing with a curtain draped out and they, they built a curtain. There was no holds barred in Sopranos. People said, what's going behind the curtains? And we couldn't say anything, you know? So we kept it real quiet. And we rehearsed with harnesses because, you know, you're connected to a harness. And we seemed to not get the right one, but Pete knew which, you know, he, he researched it. And after that rehearsal of doing it, we didn't rehearse the acting. That's another story, we'll, which I'll talk about a little bit. He found the right harness and he, he got it from Hollywood. It was really strong. And we tried it a few times. We rehearsed it a few times. And then, of course, being on the set, I really didn't have to. The situation, you know, sometimes, like I was saying, you you draw from your life into you imbue that into your work, into the words. And because the words are just words on the page, you have to bring yourself. And that's what everyone's looking for, yourself. It, it, um, and sometimes just the situation itself, the as if, so to say, um, some directors would say, um, some of my past acting teachers, the as if is, is it, it could be as strong as that memory of you, you doing certain things and, oh, I know that situation, I can act this. So that itself, Gene, his love for his family, and to me, it was, it was like, if I don't do this, then they're going to be here. So I did it for them. I mean, when I look in the photo book and I see my son and I see yeah. us being happy and that's being that's going to be destroyed, that's never going to happen. It seems to me that the only way out to liberate them, which was never really talked about in the following episode, they called Michael called me a mutt. And, but, you know, yeah. internally, my internal monologue was to do it for them. Um, although it you know it seems like a selfish thing, um, but in in that case, perhaps Gene was thinking about his family, and I'm not saying that that is a, a solution. It's not a solution to anything. But the scene, just getting back to what you said, uh, that within itself is scary within itself. And when they were on, we we did that, really didn't have to do too many takes on that. They were just. Um, Close up take, yeah. and you see me that the uh, the horror, so to say, as uh, as uh, the anxiety and the horror was, as Brenda would say it in Apocalypse Now, that was really came from the as if, as if it really was, you know, Eugene. Do you know what I mean? Although, totally. it's not, right? yeah. I hope and, that explains it, you know. No, nah, it does. And speaking of, like you said, reading words off the page, what was your reaction when you found out you were being uh, written off the show? Well, at first, I was getting calls from a lot of people, and when they were saying, "Hey, hey, Rob, do you know you have a wife?" Because uh, you know they're casting for your wife, and wow, that's that's great. What's going on? It was like the season one opener, and I have a wife. Yeah, hey, Rob, uh, what's going on? You, you know, you they're casting for your son. Uh, you know, you know. I <laughs> said, "Wow, this is going to be good." And then finally, I got a call from David, and David said, "Well, um, Bobby, I love you. I've got great news, and I got some bad news. I knew it was coming." I said, "What do you want to hear first? Well, tell me the good news first. And David explained that they wrote an episode. I'm really one of the focal points, not the only focal point, but a big part of the episode is." Is going to be be about Eugene, 
Um, but he said, uh, okay. And I said, oh, he, I, I said, that's fantastic. You got a son, he said, you got a, you have a wife. And, and so I said, what's the bad news? The bad news is you're dead. <laughs> You, you you kill yourself. Uh, well, he didn't even say that because he didn't even say that because they didn't even show me the script yet. So I said, "Well, you know, David, I'm very thankful for that." And although it, uh, the average person might think it's uh, might think it was the it was the true end to uh, your, one's um, trajectory on the show, I, I it really became a blessing because um, I'll give you an example of that which I've talked about before, Brando would, and I don't compare myself in any way to Marlon Brando, but he also said, he, he said that when he was doing um, On the Waterfront, that the scene with him and Rod Steiger, his brother, um, when he says, uh, I could have been somebody, but it was you, Charlie, um, that scene, a lot of people could identify with that, basically sold out and 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 they were kind of tempted and they gave into the temptation and lost their chance. I could have been somebody. I could have been a contender. How many people who go through life I could have been a contender. So now I'll parallel that as a metaphor to my my particular episode. And I said, well, I realized this after I did it. His was Eugene and where they shot it and the way they built up the character that uh, a lot of people would love to get out, to move away from their situation. They inherit money or whatever, and their lives are better, And they, but they can't. Those people that are around them won't let them do that. So I understood that people were gonna understand or empathize with Eugene in the sense that they wanna get out and Tony won't let him out because he doesn't want anyone to be happy, Tony Soprano. Everyone's gotta be miserable. If he's miserable, so are you. So, <laughs> but I knew people would really dig it because, you know, a lot of people want to get out of this situation, but they just can't, whether it be like, for instance, I just told you an example. I have my family here. I really wouldn't want to move to LA. So if someone offered me a TV show in LA or something in LA, I really would have to think about it. Do you know what I mean? And so oh, it's kind of the same kind of a situation. So that's the, um, the story with members only. Gotcha. And on the show, you obviously spend a lot of time with Joseph Ganascoli, a.k.a. Vito. What is your relationship like with um, Vito nowadays, uh, as you guys both have gotten a little older? Well, me me and Joseph don't really talk a lot. Um, um, or uh, he, he lives out in Long Island. When he was living in Brooklyn, we I guess we had a better, a closer relationship. Uh, Joe's a, a real uh, gentleman, and he's a, a great chef. I mean, I, I cook on Instagram, but he's the he's the real deal. Huh. And uh, I mean, he does things and that are uh, amazing with food. He and 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 he does his own thing. And I don't really see Joseph a lot because he's all the way out there. But I do, and I started with not only him with John Fiore, um, who played Gigi Gaston, and I just worked with John on an independent feature. Uh, about a week ago, um, last, not just Tuesday, last Tuesday, I worked with John Fiore. So we keep in touch. We keep in touch on Instagram and, and it's fun. When we, it was really fun to, to be with him and to laugh about the, all stuff that we did together of just telling jokes. Love it. And Robert, are there any other members of the cast that you stay in touch with nowadays? Uh, Vincent Pastor, Maureen Van Zandt. Vincent's directing me in a play that's going to be at Asbury Park called Marlon Brando Sat Right Here, written by Louis LaRusso, who was an Italian-American playwright, who actually gave Danny Aiello, Danny Aiello his first thought in a play called Land Post Reunion, which was produced on Broadway. So I'm working with him. I'm working with Maureen Van Zandt um, from, the, from the show. Um, and um, we're doing that play. And so I do keep in touch with Vinny and also Vincent Curatola we're doing and Federico. So there are people that I, I keep in touch with. We're doing, a, we're doing a comedy show at CPAC September 10th at Catarat, uh, hosted by Fred Rubino, com comedian Fred Rubino. So that's in New Jersey. So yeah, I do con I keep in touch. These are some of the people yeah. I, uh, I uh, keep in contact with. Sometimes I, I'll just do little emails with certain people who, but those are more of a people I that I communicate with. Gotcha. Wait, and so something I'm curious about that I know like 
things have really evolved and grown, especially with The Sopranos, since like the emergence of TikTok, YouTube, Instagram. How have you seen firsthand the growth of not only the show, but all the characters in the show through platforms like TikTok, Instagram, YouTube? It's really, um, uh, Eric, it's, it's quite amazing because uh, um, you guys really didn't live through The Sopranos. Did you live through The Sopranos when it was on? No. We lived through The See? Sopranos during COVID. Okay. There you go. You just said it. And yeah. let me tell you, it, it, it opened so many doors for all of us, uh, for myself especially, people really appreciating what I did. I mean, I'm in New Jersey. People recognize me. Mr. Fanara, how are you? I mean, it really <laughs> opened up a lot of doors for your generation, too, to, to see a great TV show. So it really was a blessing. Uh, your falsehood is my truth. My truth is your falsehood. You know, this mistake is 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 a great thing that happened in my in my career. And, and, and also in terms of uh, people appreciating it and doing events like I'm doing with uh, Vinnie Curatola and Federico and and um, getting paid for it and, and signings. I have a, uh, uh, a cafe and, and, and cigar a venture that I'm doing now called Omerta Cigars, Omerta Cafe. Get Omerta.com on Instagram. I'm plugging in a little bit here. For <laughs> and I'm with Danny Grimaldi, Patty Parisi, and Jason Cerbone. Um, and we're 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 doing um Jackie Jr. We're doing this uh, um branding here and we're we're trying to get the coffee and the cigars out and they're really quality it's really quality stuff and so it really opened a lot of doors and and really it's it's just really great maybe two generations got to see the show it's really it's just it's really it, it, I never expected it you know well, it's not going anywhere either I mean I yeah. see Instagram reels stuff on YouTube all the time with highlights from the show with James with you yeah. with really everyone yeah they so, even had that thing with me with that members only thing they're saying that the guy with the members only uh that I I survived or something I don't know it's like this whole trajectory of they explain Eugene and and people always ask me, would you think that's the ending? Do you think that explains it? I say, you know, the best the best uh, way it was explained was by Peter Bogdanovich, God rest his soul too. Wonderful director. Uh, um, uh, so he, he explained it as, it was open-ended. You, you saw the Boy Scouts, you saw the members only jacket, you saw the, 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 the brothers, the African-American cats, uh, and you had Jimmy and you had his family. And so you had a, um, a, uh, a pastiche, a, 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 a collage uh, of what America is, is basically. And you had the, uh, the FBI there and uh, a collage of what America is about, but it was up to you to create the ending. He left it open-ended. You can think what you want. Did the members only guy blow away Tony? Well, you know, mine, one thing that we know is going to be is that um, the perpetuation of certain Boy Scouts, the Black Hand, whatever, the Cosa Nostra, I don't like to say Mafia, and which, by the way, in the beginning, it was created because governments and the, the people in power were corrupt and they were raping uh, women uh, in the village, in, in the towns of Sicily. And it was created as a protection society to protect innocent people. Of course, it, uh, it yeah. branched off into different directions as it got along. And some people, uh, well, where there's money, there's corruption. Yes. I and, rest my case. <laughs> yeah, and Robert, speaking of this corruption you mentioned, it's it's actually funny. So my favorite book I've ever read is I Heard You Paint Houses. And obviously you were in The Irishman and there was a whole lot of corruption going on at that time. Um, have you ever gotten the opportunity to meet any of these figures that so maybe like Frank Sheeran, um, maybe some of the Jimmy Hoffa stature back, uh, back in that time era? Or is that not really your time? Well, it's not my time. I, I didn't get a meet, chance to meet uh, Frank Sheeran um, or anyone involved in the film that was real life. The only people I met was the actors who I, who, to whom I worked with. But I did 
if I might digress, get a chance to chat with uh, Frank Lucas from American Gangster wow. and Richie Roberts, who was on set. Some of the act, some of the crew people really didn't want to know Frank because they felt that he corrupted and he was responsible for a lot of deaths with the heroin, the blue magic. And I really respected those people too, but I did get a chance to speak with him. He seemed like a nice enough guy. How is he not going to be nice? They're doing a film about him. You know what I mean? And, and he's making a little bit of money. He did his time. So, you know, he also did not, didn't do as much time because he, I think he gave evidence to Richie. Um, he did some time when he gave some yeah, he evidence did. to Richie Rob is to bring down some, but you know, of course, um, uh, getting back to the Irishman, I, I think it was a very interesting book. And I think that Frank, it, it seems to me that the Jimmy Hoffa, some people say it's not true. I, I have a tendency to believe that 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 particular um, killing really was really orchestrated from Philadelphia, Buffalino and and um, that he, Frank Sheeran, did have a big part of that happening. In terms of the Gallo thing, the Joe Gallo, now that's a Colombo. Uh, I'm not so sure about that because I know some have some friends that say, well, that that wasn't true. But listen, you can't get the whole truth all the time. You get some of the truth, and Hollywood gives you some of the truth, and then they yeah. kind of romanticize some of the other stuff. But we like it. You know, we walk out of the theater thinking that, hey, we can be Tony Soprano. We can be yeah. know, whomever. Totally. And um, Robert, you had the opportunity to work with, you know, Martin Corsese in The Irishman. How has that collaboration helped influence your approach towards acting? The biggest thing working with Martin um, was, I would call it, creating a matrix, an atmosphere uh, where you can really be productive. There's no stress. There's no anxiety. In television, even on Sopranos, there was a, um, I would say, there was a relaxed feeling to it. But also, we got to get this. You know, we need to get this. Sometimes you feel a little bit pushed. Oh, well, you get the script supervisor. You got to use those words that they wrote. Now with Marty, it's a whole different ball game. I mean, the take that we I, he used an Irishman was the take that he said, "All right, do whatever you want this time. Um, go ahead and and uh, and and you know keep to the script, but you know let it go, whatever. Go ahead, let it go. You know it." And we did about four or five takes, and I and I ad libbed a lot of this stuff. I was feeling it. It gives you that openness to do that. Mm -hmm. That being said, it it's um. Only actors can only work in atmospheres, and Sopranos created that. Let me just say that. Um, but there are other TV sets and film sets that are a little bit. Uh, Ridley Scott was great too. American Gangster. All the good, good people, the good sets. There is an atmosphere of that you can really create and be productive, as opposed to, you know, we got to get this. It's you know, it's stressful, and and and, and so that with Marty. He creates that atmosphere. And that's why he gets great performances from his best actors to the other actors. And there's no small parts. There's a small minded people. If you look at a film, you look at like a, a, a wonderful um, uh, uh, um, tapestry that comes together. The fabric comes together. All the colors are important. Uh, all the parts of the body are important. One can't work without the other, correct? And Marty treats you that way. Well, I yeah. rest my case. I rest my case. There you go. <laughs> good, question, that, but good question, Evan. That's a good question. Thank you. I, as we're on the topic of, of such legends, what, what are some similarities and differences between Martin and uh, David Chase? Um, um, well, Marty uh, mixes it up a little bit more. He, you know, in television, um, they have a tendency, the directors, to leave you alone. You get you. They know that you know the role, and and they allow you to do it. If they have a a, a co correction, they might. But usually, they leave you alone. They hired you to do that, and and you know, with Marty, it gets a little bit more hands on. You know, he might give you a little bit of a, you know, try this or try that. Uh, you know, I think that's the difference. And David, he really. 
was more for myself uh, more around you know what I mean uh or he was around uh, less hands-on but he was there it was great to have him there of course because he knew uh, he was genius of course he is a genius and mm -hmm. uh, but that's the kind of the difference between David. More like, I used to think he was like a leprechaun gnome when I was around, because he would show up like, you know, like that little gnome that, you know, holy, there he is. Hey, David. I, all of a sudden he'd be there, like, you know, then he's gone and he's there, you know, but his presence was always um, a positive presence, wanting everyone to do the best they can. And he really, a great gentleman who, who really loved to have fun and just, love the experience you could see he just loved it you know no, it, it's so awesome to hear these stories from you from someone that's obviously been around it been doing this for so long i guess considering how long you have been doing this i guess i guess today it seems like there's so many less like great tv shows and great movies coming out than there were maybe two three even four decades ago what why do you think it's so much harder to create quality than it was back then well i mean there's still, you know, I look at it as work, regardless of the TV TV show. Um, um, it's 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 a hard it's a hard question. Uh, I mean, if you think about that question, you you think of Puccini or the great composers of great operas. Why don't they do it? Why don't we get great operas now too? I suppose nothing really lasts forever in a way. I mean, those films by Marty Taxi Driver, uh, the early films, uh, even Gene Hackman's French Connection, the grittiness of it. And uh, I, I believe it's cyclical, you know, that it, it can come around again. The new filmmakers, it, it, it'll come around again. But it seems, it also, also seems that as we move away from the core of, um, and we get less into being around each other, um, it kind of lessens, it's watered down a little bit more. I suppose that could be uh, one of the reasons, but there are still, you know, I mean, good series. I, I did enjoy The Whale with Brendan Fraser, if you saw that. The Wrestler with Jimmy, uh, Mickey Rock, which was years ago, but getting more contemporary, they, I, I thought that The Whale was an excellent film. And um, Did you watch Succession? I haven't watched Succession, but I do. I do like The Mandalorian. I think there's a there's a. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love the old and even Andor. I really like. There's that one episode um, of Andor, uh, One Way Out, that really was really re re resounded in my soul. One way out, you know what I mean? To 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 break free, I mean, or just can stay in this in this uh, sedentary place, and 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 we need to take need to take chances. You took a chance and you asked me to be on here. And I said, yes, right. It's taking a chance. It worked. If we don't take chances, I think the best actors and the best directors and the best inventors are people that take chances. Maybe even the the, the person who, who uh, submerged themselves, the, I forgot, I don't know his name. I'm not a really big scientist with the submerge of the, the craft that, yes. Uh, to see the Titanic. He, he probably, he was a, he bucked the whole system. He was a big dreamer. I mean, he, he, not right all the time. Unfortunately, in that case, it's terrible. It'd be wrong, right? Yeah. It's fatal, yeah. yeah. And th that was kind of a question I had for you then, Robert, was um, in the last five years, what are some movies that you really have enjoyed that came out? I did like, well, I did mention uh, uh, um, the... Uh, um, the Wrestler. I, I I don't know if that's five years ago. It may be more than five years. Uh, the the Whale. I thought that was great. Um, what else? Um, there's that World War Two uh, all, all along the Western Front. Okay. Mm -hmm. That that was a good one that I, I liked. Um, there was one I I forgot. Uh, it was on uh, the Criterion. I'm a member. Of, I, I joined the Criterion to see all the old films and uh, EO called EO that I really liked about a donkey and and. A, a person who loves the donkey and 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 what happens to the donkey from the beginning he's in a circus something happens he gets out of the circus. they follow the donkey where he goes where he ends up i don't want to give out the ending but this woman who, who was the who loved this and they're very smart intelligent animals i mean um yeah um 
that was the EO was was excellent too. I can't think of, I know I can't really think of a lot of films. I, I, since the COVID, I haven't been going to a lot, see a lot of films as as I used to go yeah. and see. You know what I mean? Uh, yeah. That new one with that won the Academy Award. That that um, the, a Chinese uh, one that I, I I haven't seen that yet. I have to catch up really on the films. I watch a lot of old films like. Um, it's like Sam Fuller. I've, I've been into his films. Um, um, Big Red One, 40 Guns. I mean, the guy was ahead of his time, his films. And he just was like, talk about Moxie, you know, just a reporter. And uh, he was gritty, you know what I mean? His films are gritty. And he, and, and he, they took on great subjects. I'm a lover of John Cassavetti's films uh, for what they are. You know, I mean, uh, so, I mean, I do watch a lot of old films. And I, I guess I... You, you know, I mean, I'm not really into the big Marvel stuff and uh, Spider-Man, Batman. I'm not too much into that. I like stories about human experience, struggle, our struggles, and and uh, and happiness too, and comedy also. Yeah, but, and so spe speaking of different genres, Robert, it seems like you've done you know a handful of Italian American roles. Are there any like specific roles or genres that you'd like to explore in the future that you haven't had the chance to yet? Well, I mean, I I I have a, I mean, I I have explored some roles um, that play in plays. I have more of a chance to do what I wish to do in plays. Uh, I played um, this character in uh, a scientist, uh, a Nobel Prize winner in this this uh, play called Enigma Variations. Abel's Norco, and uh, that was about love, and it was about ambition, and how he gave up. How about a woman who passed away or truly loved him? And, and the woman comes back into his life uh, posing as the person, but she's really not, or something or other. Uh, he, uh, she goes and tells him, oh, she comes back. Um, she, uh, a friend of that woman who passed away goes back to tell him that she really, truly loved him. And he really regrets that he never really had a relationship with him. And then, he, then she drops the bomb and tells him that she passed away and he, he regrets not being with her. But anyway, I've had more opportunity. Now, there are things that I've done, like in Sinner, although my last name was Tanetti, uh, it was Ron Tanner uh, initially, and then they changed it to Tanetti. Uh, but I have done some other roles, especially I played Lieutenant Bricker, that ends in an R, in um, Blue Bloods, my last role on television with... Um, Leaves Shriver. Um, so I I I I think and I'm only I'm, I haven't been so pigeonholed into just doing the the wise guy and Italian roles. But yes, what you're saying is true. We all dream of doing uh roles that are, you know, that were not type typecast. And I am um typecast. And today I it's so weird. I got a I got a text from a casting director. I won't name names uh for a film that I auditioned, I didn't get for it to film my arm and hands. <laughs> and I told my manager, what's going on here? You know what I mean? Arm and hands, the arm, I'm not arm and hammer. So I just referred that person to my manager and also gave them my IMDB. Not yeah. to say that I think I've gone beyond being an arm and hand. <laughs> you know, that's funny. Now I can make a joke and I'm the arm yeah. and hand now, you know. My hands and my arm, you know, it's just like, you know. Do, now, here's the thing, you know, did this person, did this casting director, I don't know her name, did she look into who I was? She saw me on Casting Network. She saw, did she look at my work before she asked me to do, I mean, there's nothing wrong with doing work, any kind of work, but in that particular case, I mean, I, listen, I went in for one line in the Hurt Locker, I mean, the Hurt Locker, Jeremy Renner, and I didn't do Hurt Locker, but there was a, a program, a TV show called The Unusuals that he was doing after he did Hurt Locker, before he got the nomination for the Academy Award with Amber Tamlin, Tamberlin. It was about police. It was a comedy in this, like a Barney Miller, but only a real, more realistic Barney Miller. And I went in for one line and they, uh, my manager, Eric Favor, who God rest his soul, he, um, he uh, said, do you want to go in for it? Yeah, sure, I'll go in for it. Yeah, it's one line. I don't care. It's right. It's all right. I want to do it. So it's, it's TV show. And I went in and, and they kept me there. And they, uh, although the TV show didn't make it, I was starting to get built up 
my character was getting built up and it was creating, a, even like Eugene Pontecorvo, I asked um, one of the writers, who was Eugene? She said, we're going to make it up as you go along. As they got to know me, they started, yeah. not to say that I'm that guy, suicidal, but yeah. uh, that was something that that was dramatic. But um, in that in that case, the writers got to know me and, and, and also in Unusual. So, uh, you go in for these, but for that arm and hand case, this is for you know. I mean, did this person do the research about uh -huh. me? I don't look at it as an insult. People sometimes they don't do it. God bless them, you know. But you have to straighten them out too, right, Evan? Yeah, right, Mary. <laughs> you got it. Straighten them out. <laughs> yeah. So, Robert, um, another question I had then it had to be the difference between doing a play in a TV or movie. I feel like a play would kind of be a little bit more stressful because you're there's no like second takes you kind of just got to go how have you kind of managed that well in, in doing a play is a there's a comfortability of having a run and you you rehearse repetitiously doing yeah. it so there's confidence and safety in that it's more nerve-wracking for me to do film um to get it where I want to get it without being self-conscious and having my attention on the other person, which is where it should be. I love theater. I was just saying this to a friend. I think I love the theater more than I really do love filmmaking, but hmm. in a way I haven't really, as you were saying, got a chance to really open up um, except for members only in the films that I, that I've, uh, I've done. Members only was really a great, chance to open up and have a trajectory in the plays i do have a chronological trajectory even if there isn't a chronological even if it's an absurd play by harold pinter this mm -hmm. there's a, um, um, a craftiness to it and and, and um, a growth process in the rehearsal and then knowing in a play you always have the other the next night and you and you're going to be off just like you're going to be off sometimes in certain takes and you get it as they go, and the director, he has, he has a good eye, like Martin, Marty has a great eye. He knows that's the one. That's a good one. Take it. We're good. Let's move on. So there's more comfortability in theater than, uh, for me at least, than, than film. But um, I, I like both mediums, but I, I, I have a tendency to lean more towards the theater. You know, I, yeah. David Mabin would call it um, uh, confidence in repose, suppose, because they're not all the cameras and stuff. But uh, um, you got to do what you love to do, right? I mean, and what Absolutely. you're good at. Not everyone's great at uh, certain things. And I I mean, that's the way I feel. So, Robert, as someone who's had so much history and so many different types of like film with TV, with movies, what would your advice be to a 20-something looking to break into the industry as an actor, a director, a writer, whatever it may be? What would your best piece of advice be? Well, I'll tell you what uh, George Lucas or, or Steven Spielberg will, will say, and not that I'm in any class with them. They'll say, well, now, there's more opportunities now to, uh, with the I, uh, the iPhone and and uh, to do your to get together with friends and, and to create your own content. Um, I would say, do as much work and 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 don't sit around and wait for the phone to ring. Um, get out there, and uh, we used to call, um, you know. Um, pounding the streets and, and you know, doing the rounds um, and trying to produce work, trying to get itself together with agents and casting directors. But I think it's right nowadays, it's it's better to get with a group of people and to a, a perfect example of that. There's a book by David Mamet. I love David Mamet, what he talks about called True or False Actors, uh, uh, Common Sense common sense for actors, true or false. And he talks about some friends of his who went to California because he's from Chicago. Um, and they created in Chicago, the Steppenwolf Theater Company with John Malkovich, Gary Sinise, uh, David, uh, whoever else, a lot of uh, Chuck, Chuck Stransky. Um, and uh, of course, um, who played Joey Zaza? I'm, I'm losing a little bit in The Godfather. Uh, ah, Joey Zaza, Joey Zaza. One second, Siri. Joey Zaza and The Godfather actor. <laughs> Come on, Joe Mantegna. There you go. There you go. Um, they started in this theater, 
they did plays. Of course, not everyone has David Mamet as a writer, you know, to write, you know, and then do plays because he's a brilliant writer. But that that idea of creating a, a, a network of people who get together, one writer, one actor, one director, and doing your own thing. Nowadays, it's, it's a lot easier. You know what I mean? Uh, you can even hire people, lighting people, but at the same time, you can do your own thing. You know, when I see, when I see sometimes, the, you know, the, the, there's a guy on Instagram called The Sudden Singer, The Sudden Singer. And he does, he's from Germany. He won, he's got Germany's, he won Germany's Got Talent. He won the big, the big <laughs> prize there. Right. And he sings opera, a sudden singer, look him up. And he's got 62,000, 100,000 views. And he's coming to America in July. I mean, there's a way to advertise yourself through this to get something big. That's my granddaughter, Juniper. She might be a big star one day, who knows? <laughs> She's smart, she won't do this. <laughs> but anyway, you can't tell people what to do or women or men. But anyway, so I mean, there's a lot of different mediums that, but I would say more or less to do the do work and 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 to work. If you're a writer, write every day. If you're an actor, try to work on something. Get together with friends, join a workshop, a class. Don't think, don't use that class as a crush not to work. If you get a play or you get something, do it. If you got the, a little short film you want to get together, even me, I do these little short films fooling around with guys at the gym. In a way, I'm creating, I'm directing, right? I'm I'm yeah. directing. I, I wanted to really direct if God, you know, when I pray every day that you know I'll get the opportunity to do that and whatever level that I'm blessed with. But there's ways to do it. So you don't be don't be discouraged. Now, that being said, it's a little bit tougher because um the commercial business has dropped out the, and we're fighting for residuals, we're fighting the union is negotiating with the unions because of the live streaming. You used to have a lot more longevity years ago. You get into a commercial and keep you going for a whole entire year. You get into a TV show, the residuals keep you going. It's a lot tougher now for beginning actors and directors and writers. But that doesn't change the fact if you have something great to, that you want to share with the world, it, it shouldn't discourage you. And if people want to listen to you, and you'll know if you're in the right place, you'll know. Uh, and regardless of whether, you know, there's a lot of people who never... Had the, you know, they they just never got the the platform to really show what they can do, but the the effort is important. Going so I I have a tendency of saying, if you're at the pool table, you have to go to the billiard table. If you walk away from the billiard table, well, you're not going to play billiards and you're not going to get that great shot you've been practicing, right? So I've yeah. walked away a few times and I got back into it, but now that I'm back, I, I don't really want to walk away because I, I I get joy from joy from doing it, a peace of mind. Yeah. From, from acting it's the talent that i was given and and so I, I enjoy it you know and that's why i don't say really no to a lot so because it's in it, i enjoy talking to, to to new people in the business like you guys you guys and and trying to inspire other people make an impact in some sort of way no definitely yeah, absolutely like you said it means a lot that you do take time out of your busy day to come on this and speak with us. Not so busy, but I am. No, I do have a Zoom that. tonight. We're taking what we can. Which coming off the COVID, there's a writer strike. It's it's still not what it was. It seemed to pick up uh, in the winter of. I got I got some really great opportunities. Opportunities to go in with Bobby again for his new film called Wise Guys. Didn't get in the film, but it's picking up a little bit. But uh, now with this whole thing going, I hope it gets back. Well, yeah, nonetheless. To have you sharing your stories has been a real treat for us. And I guess before we let you go back to that beautiful granddaughter of yours, we'd right. love we'd love to hear a uh, a final James Gandolfini story from set if you have one that maybe comes to mind. Well, the great uh, a funny one. Um, well, hold on one second. I'll give it to you. I'll give you a little bit of a visual. I gotta have a little visual. I, you know, because we're visual yeah. people. Yes, we are. This painting here is a painting that was 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 painted by this artist John Podersky. He's on Instagram. He's very good, and he gave it to me. This is Jimmy and me at the golf course. Wow! Um, just before um, I, um, I leave him, I drive him up to talk to one of the. Uh, I forgot the, the the premise of what it was, but anyway, in this particular episode, Jimmy, we're in the golf course, and I think it was at this point. See his bored look on his face? Yeah. Jimmy said to me, he said, Bobby, 
I'll give you $5,000 if you drive this golf cart into the pond over there. <laughs> <laughs> and he was my friend and he was serious. I said, Just drive it up there. So <laughs> tell him you lost control. I said, are you serious? He said, yeah, I'm serious. He was always serious. James was always one who would test life. He always challenged the 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 board the lines like the, you know the border lines you know yeah, the, yeah, yeah. The, uh, the yellow those yellow pads uh, they're constricting lines I forgot what they call them anyway anything that had like a, a boundaries you know border lines James was one to say why is it that that way anyway to, to finish that story he said he asked me I said James I just can't do it if something happens to you. I know I won't lose the job, but a lot of people are going to be pissed off at me. That, I don't think I told him, but it was in the back of my mind. So I told him no, but he was serious. Now I'll tell you one little short story and then, and then we'll end it. Another story about him. Cause I love talking about Jimmy. He's alive when I'm talking about him. Um, this story has to do with when we were in uh, Norway, we went to Elsinore castle, the, the castle of uh, Hamlet and Denmark. I don't know if you've ever been there, it's a beautiful castle. And then we went down to the lower bowels of the castle where they would torture certain soldiers or people they would torture for sedition or whatever it was. And there was one room, or what was it? it was, actually, it was a cell, a brick cell, where they were, um, it was made as, it was like a triangle and it got smaller and smaller. And the tour guide said, what they would do is they would put you in there and each week they would have a triangle like plywood, or whatever was made up of like a wood that would go in and you would go, eventually you would be in the corner with a small like creased in and that would be the torture and let, they would let you, it's a torture, it's a cruel torture. They would yeah. close you in actually in this in this cell. So the tall guy left. So I said, wow, this is really, this is this terrible thing, James. And he says, uh, let's go in. What? Let's go in. What do you mean? <laughs> I want to go to the, I want to go to where the end, where the, the, where the prisoner or whatever, the traitor was. I want to go to that. Are you crazy? We're going to get in trouble. They're going to kick us out of here. Come on, let's go. He dragged me in there and we actually went to that point. And that was an eerie feeling to be at that point where they put that last piece of plywood and they caved you in and that was it. And then they starved you to death, man. And that's the kind of guy he was. I, I thought he was berserk. And the same thing happened on the golf course. <laughs> and I think that's what why he was so great. Because a lot of people will tell you, and there's good and evil in this world. You got to do the good things. But I think that a lot of people who have made mistakes, um, they come back better people. And I think James was one of those. He might have made some mistakes, just like me and you guys have, will, will do in your life. But you always come back. There's forgiveness and there's mercy when you're with the right people. And you come back better for it. Because without the contradiction... And the dialectic, we were, we're never going to be where we're at. And if life was just a bowl, a bowl of cherries, how boring would that be, right? No, no. Wow. Robert? There, there you go. There's my story. That's, That's amazing. Right. Amazing story. We're um, extremely grateful for you coming on, sharing your wisdom and your stories with us. Thank and you, Merrick. Thank you, Evan. Very appreciative. And we look forward to keeping up with everything you do moving forward. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure to be here. Is there a name to the podcast? Uh, maybe I, oh yeah, the political. Uh, Every, everything but politics. Everything but politics. See, I, whenever I see politics, I say, oh shit, I hope there's not that. I really didn't read it correctly. I'm sorry. <laughs> but politics, I love it. And I love everything but politics. Watch <laughs> it and be there. Awesome. <laughs> Thank you, Robert. Thanks guys. Right. See ya.